The majority of the gaming community agreed on one thing in early 2017, that Nintendo Switch was going to fail. It's funny how often in popular culture, in film, and particularly in gaming, we all want to play the revisionist history game. We all pretend like we knew that something was going to be awful a year after we lost our $60 pre-order. We pretend like we knew Fortnite was going to be gaming's most successful IP after spending 5 years saying the franchise would fail and Epic was wasting their time. But there's one piece of gaming culture that fits that mold all too well. Mainstream media, gaming blogs, forums, and unfathomable amounts of gamers outside of the hardcore fan base said that the Nintendo Switch was going to fall flat on its face. That no one wanted a hybrid console, and that the system many were deeming the Wii U 2.0 would be a total failure for Nintendo, putting the company on the ropes. A year and a half later, and well... No one wants to admit they were one of those people. Hell, for a while, I was one of those people. I was someone so disillusioned with the company after the previous generation that I genuinely believed a return to a console that in any way resembled the Wii U was a death sentence. But I was wrong. Today is not about looking at the Switch for what it has always been. We know it's a portable. We know people are buying it anyways. Today, it's time to look at what the Switch is a year later. How the Switch has impacted the medium, and how Nintendo crafted a comeback that shouldn't have been necessary to begin with. This is the switch that changed an industry. I'm getting ready to serve. All I do is throw that ball up in the air. And when I, oh, jeez. And there goes the tennis racket. <laughs> I didn't have it on there all the way. Talking about what went wrong with the Wii U is an exercise in futility in the same vein as watching Wile E. Coyote chase Roadrunner. We all know how this ends, we know how this plays out, so why put ourselves through it? Instead, to provide some context as to the situation Nintendo was facing before the Switch launched, here's a quote from the CEO of the Pokemon Company. I told Nintendo that the Switch wouldn't be a success before it launched. I thought that in the age of the smartphone, no one would carry around a games console. This is the CEO of one of Nintendo's most profitable and consistent IPs, saying the Switch was going to fail. It is also a pretty fair representation of what most of the gaming community believed would become of the Switch. It was supposed to fail. An entire collective of people had let the dismal 13 million sales of the Wii U cloud decades of success for a company that just one generation before had a piece of hardware reach a level of success previously unknown to the industry. The Wii U was underpowered, it was poorly marketed, and when I say poorly marketed, what I really mean is it was handed some of the worst marketing gaming had ever seen. It was given the most confusing reveal in E3 history, and it was entirely abandoned almost immediately by seemingly every third-party developer with more than one computer in their office. The Wii U was dead on arrival, and for a long time it was obvious that Nintendo was turning their attention elsewhere. People wanted a system with better longevity, or they thought they did, one that was on par with what the PS4 and Xbox One were offering. They wanted Nintendo to quit with the gimmicks and go back to making home consoles that were just that home consoles. So when the rumors began to swirl that Nintendo was creating a hybrid system, one that looked an awful lot like an upgraded Wii U and maintained the ideas of the dying PlayStation Vita, people were sure of only one thing. This was not going to go well. The tide shifted a bit once the reveal finally came, but a large portion of gamers maintained their position. The Switch couldn't possibly succeed in a market where gamers play games on their phone. The system is too big to be portable, hell, no one wants a portable, and it's too underpowered to compete, and thus will lack third-party support. Well, a year and a half later, some of this is true. Some of it, a year later, is laughable. The first source of the year-long turnaround? Well, we're gonna call that... How long did this rescue take you? 20? 30 hours? It took me 50 hours! 50? Wow, you suck! Oh, look, I only have 8 rupees. Take it for your time. The Breath of the Wild Effect Before we dive headfirst into how the Switch shut down nearly every naysayer over the course of a year, we have to do the responsible thing and look at the biggest factor in allowing the Switch's immediate growth. If I had to define the term the Breath of the Wild Effect, it would be the effect that a single well-known intellectual property can have on determining the long-term success of a platform in a launch environment. To put it simply, Breath of the Wild proved that the Switch could sell off of the IPs in their back pocket alone, but it also proved that a single release of the magnitude of Breath of the Wild could sell any system at launch by itself, and would be indicative of the system's future. See, gamers and publishers are not all that different. They both have a similar habit when it comes to something that costs them money. In 2018, they're much more likely to wait and see. Maybe that's out of cynicism or years of industry disappointment, but regardless, what happens is a system like the Switch launches. Gamers don't want to spend $300 on a new platform, 
with one real game. Publishers don't want to invest in an unproven commodity rising out of failure, and so they both wait. With the Switch, Breath of the Wild took the gaming media by storm. The game was everywhere, and it was being touted as a modern masterpiece, a game every gamer needs to play, a game worth the $300 system alone. And at this point, everyone wanted in. Every gamer needed to play Breath of the Wild. Most didn't own a Wii U, so now they were scrambling to find a Switch post-launch. The fervor was something every company dreams of. All of a sudden, publishers see that the system is performing, it's flying off of shelves and they want it, and thus the third-party development and porting begins. Breath of the Wild, in being a damn near masterpiece, put Nintendo back on top, literally overnight. It put the Switch in a position where, for that first year, it damn near couldn't fail as a result. The game was selling more copies, its install number higher, than the Switch itself. You heard that right, and I've mentioned it before. Breath of the Wild sold more Switch copies than Switches sold. This is likely due to pre-orders without systems, and people swiping the game before the console's back in stock, but it substantiates the point being made. But from here, Nintendo made sure the Switch succeeded in an area that few expected it to succeed. No way. Nobody understands us, and they won't understand until it is far too late. Some of the indie games already released have gone on to become million sellers worldwide. In the future, we are looking to release around 20 to 30 indie games on Nintendo Switch each week. We definitely expect to see some great games among them. 700 games. 700. That's how many games are already available in the Switch's library. Tatsumi Kimishima recently stated that they are looking at releasing between 20 and 30 indie games a week. That's between 1,000 and 1,500 over the course of a year. What the f***? This is where Nintendo creates a double-edged sword with the Switch and makes the system both more appealing a year in and a bit concerning as well. Part of the reason the Switch has become such a success is it took after the Vita's example and became something a Nintendo system has never really been outside of maybe the 3DS, an indie machine. Some of the system's greatest games are bite-sized indie releases that boost the console-exclusive outlook of the system and inflate its library in meaningful ways. Golf Story should be viewed as one of the best games of its release year as time goes by. Yoku's Island Express, while not exclusive, is perfectly suited in its metro Metrovania pinball action for a handheld. Pool Panic is one of Adult Swim's most unique experiences. And the list goes on and on and on and on and we're starting to run into the problem. See, while it's great that the Switch has become the home to so many indie games, while this helps the system and gives exposure to these experiences and shows AAA studios how well games are selling on the platform in the process, a bit of a snag is starting to be hit. Steam is a platform that simply seems to let everyone in. This leads to the Steam store constantly being a mess and indirectly supporting games that are replicants of other experiences, as well as games that violate the terms of service, games that exist only for achievements, and games that are just downright awful caches and do nothing but bring the collective quality of the platform down. The Switch is beginning to run into a similar issue. There is quickly becoming far too many titles hitting the platform to the point where the quality in general of these games cannot possibly be reasonable across the board. And because of how basic Nintendo's current eShop and online services are, they begin to drown out the exposure of better titles, specifically smaller indie ones. The 20 to 30 games a week is great until you put it into any sort of perspective or real context. Would you rather have 30 games to sift through attempting to find a game of quality or 5 games a week, all of which are of quality? I think 9 times out of 10 the latter is the far better option. But being an indie machine is great, what's far more surprising is where Nintendo's mainstream support is coming from and how that's changed the way people view a Nintendo console. Oh no, this is my state. Hi, I'm a crossing guard who can walk, so I have jurisdiction over all of you. Must be serious. They brought in the big guns. The biggest killer of the Wii U is about as easy to identify as Cliff Blazinski in a poor disguise buying a thousand copies of Lawbreakers from your local GameStop to keep his ego fed. The Wii U's lack of a true third-party support system killed that system from nearly the moment it hit store shelves. The Switch, on the other hand, has taken a different path. The Switch still isn't the third-party machine that Nintendo had hoped for. In fact, that concern is one of the concerns cited when examining why a recent stock drop occurred. But one of the only reasons the Switch has seen the success it has is because at the very least, third parties care now. See, part of the current third party issue is that many developers and publishers, as already mentioned, took a wait and see approach to the Switch after the Wii U catastrophe. 
and thus a good amount of game development and porting began well after the Switch's launch. But what it has now, what it's now getting, is turning the Switch into a console that can be a main home system contender. Unlike the Wii U, the Switch is slowly becoming home to the most popular games in the world from third-party developers, and in the process, the Switch is also becoming home to a variety of games, and a system that has something for literally every kind of gamer. And that's part of what the Wii U was missing, and something that all too often Nintendo shied away from in the past. The Switch is retiring the notion that Nintendo systems are systems for kids and families only. Want to play Dark Souls on the go? Pretty soon that will become a reality. Want to play Fortnite after you finish your match with Splatoon? You can do that. But it's the unexpected support that's truly turned the Switch into a force. Bethesda support, placing Skyrim in its first truly portable setting, getting Doom, whose gameplay perfectly fits the on-the-go mantra, to run on the Switch, getting the darkest game of last year in Wolfenstein 2 on the system. This has added play diversity unlike most Nintendo systems see in their first year on the market and more third parties are following suit. Sure, the Switch is still getting its FIFAs and even 2Ks, but what these games do more than anything else is prove that regardless of the Switch's specs, it is relatively easy to port games down to the system, and more importantly, the system's displacement amongst the echelons of the more powerful hardware does not have to scare away companies that last gen were nowhere to be seen. But that does lean into the very last reality of the Switch, the one that is truly up in the air. My good plates! This is done! Despite my best efforts, fitting in here continues to be quite a chore. It confounds me. The future of the Switch is incredibly interesting because it's in a situation that's really unlike any other we've seen a console from one of the big three find itself in. Both Microsoft and Sony have hinted at 2020, two years from now, three years after the launch of the Switch, as being the year that the generation of consoles to come next will hit store shelves. This generation will likely be the last traditional console generation, and it will also create a power parity between these two systems and the Switch like we haven't seen since last gen with the Wii. What does this mean? It means that companies that were hoping to put their games everywhere would obviously have to develop for PC, Sony, and Microsoft first, and would likely have to create an entirely different version of the game for the Switch, or an extremely degraded version of what the two more powerful systems receive. For now, it's relatively easy to justify porting to the Switch and getting your game over there, but in three years, the ease may give way to difficulty. This begs the question of how Nintendo will respond to the advancement of its competitors. The most likely scenario is that Nintendo reads the tea leaves, and instead of pulling a Wii U and introducing a strange, far too altered sequel to the Switch, they'd likely take the same approach they've taken with the 3DS for nearly a decade. Nintendo will be wisest to release incrementally upgraded versions of the Switch for the foreseeable future. Much like they did with the new 3DS, they could introduce a more powerful version of the hardware alongside a price drop for the original Switch, as well as implementing new features along the way to give the Switch longevity and keep the system feeling modern as its competitor shift and drags gamers' expectations with it. Nintendo could introduce a Switch Mini as they inevitably phase out the 3DS line and introduce a cheaper, fully docked Switch as well. What Nintendo has the capacity to do for the first time with a home console is create the ecosystem of systems they always strive for with their handheld offerings. The Switch very much should be viewed as a platform for the future as opposed to a system that operates under the traditional console life cycle. No matter what you think of the Nintendo Switch as a primary games console, it's incredibly hard to argue that the system hasn't earned its place amongst the elites of the industry, and it's all about games, games, games. The Switch flies in the face of a traditional gaming convention. It is very much unlike anything gamers have ever seen. It's a home console that isn't concerned with power, that isn't concerned with competing, it's only concerned with one thing. The Switch at its core is what the modern world appreciates convenience. It makes doing what you love easier, it allows you to do more of it, and the fact that it offers the experiences it does on top of that is nothing more than its crowning stroke. The hardcore gamer, more likely than not, is still too entrenched within the medium's breadth of offerings to seriously consider making the Switch their primary or only console, but I don't think that's what the Switch needs to be anyways if that's not your prerogative. The Switch is at its best when it's acting as a supplement, when it's not your only console. When the complaints of not getting your hands on every COD game or Madden wash away, and you can appreciate the system itself for what it offers. There's no feeling like playing Doom for 6 minutes on a subway, or playing Mario Kart with total and complete strangers in New York City. The Switch liberates console gaming from its TV shackles and places it anywhere you want. Nintendo's comeback was swift, and now we wait and see what the most innovative company in gaming has up their sleeve next. Well guys, that is it for today's doc, and it's always start of a dialogue. What do you think the Switch still needs to continue to improve? What do you think would be the best route for Nintendo when it comes to matching whatever the next box is, or the PS5? Do you think it's another generation of a Switch? Do you think it's a Switch Mini or a Switch 2.0? What do you think Nintendo must do? And most importantly, what game are you looking forward to coming to the Switch? Is it a third party game, a first party game? 
Let me know the answers to any of those questions down in the comments below. Let's have a real conversation. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. If you are not yet a member of this team, press subscribe. I put out gaming analysis, examinations, and essays just like this one twice, sometimes three times a week. So hit subscribe so you do not miss any. Really quick, big shout out to Mikkel. Uh, you can find Mikkel on YouTube. He is part of the reason that this essay is what it is. Uh, mostly because he's the one providing that lo-fi you hear in the background. Amazing artist. Check him out. Um, yeah, uh, other than that, guys, really quick announcement. Uh, next week, we'll see the first film essay. Well, I guess it's not the first, but the first film essay in a while come to the channel. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, I think it's a good segue between the gaming and film content, but the, uh, the gaming content is not going anywhere. Um, the film stuff will just supplement the gaming stuff. Uh, as most of you know, uh, film is where my education is. It's... Uh, what I was doing before YouTube. It's what I'm still doing. So keep an eye out on that or for that Sorry, and as always if you did enjoy this video I'm sorry I put up more and more each every week. Maybe I'll catch one of those Maybe you'll enjoy that But if not, thank you for giving me in this channel a shot and until next time guys. I'm out